by Debussy in this prelude is just the chiseled keyboard to obtain this kind of um, ironic, <coughs> metaphoric, um, oniric, all these adjectives to do with unreal, fantastic, daydream imagination because of course the minstrels played guitar so we have this plucking of the strings indicated in the opening, which is, by the way, very descriptive. It's almost, you would say, reductive, after all. It's a prelude for piano, absolute music per se, but titled minstrels. Um, you could imagine troubadours playing their uh, plucked instruments, and of course it could be then inevitably considered only as um, program music, which in fact it partly is, but I think it's more in the inspiration than in the piece itself. Let's abstract ourselves away from the title, which, by the way, Debussy published and wanted it to be published at the end of the piece, not at the beginning, on the top of each piece of the Preludes, written in 1910. As if not to lock the inspiration of the performer within the title's meaning, but allow it to be the music itself, um, the Debussy's music itself, speaking to the performer and therefore transmitting to the audience in this incredibly good angle between receiving and giving um, without to be limited only by the title's um, uh, implications. And I think this imagination is very important to think therefore of Debussy's prelude as such as const well, not constituting music only, of course it is music, but absolute music, not just descriptive music. And in that sense these miniatures of length are um, obviously not miniatures of scope, but of length are this um, um, very um, amazingly intense, um, non-diluted music, as if we receive it all um, so precisely, directly t touching our um, imagination as listeners, but without redundancies, with a great sense for uh, brevity, not overtaking length. For instance, these repeated notes are more echoing the preceding notes, as if almost syllabically said, quasi-syllabically laughed, <laughs> operatically, commedia dell'artically, uh, not group of three, which he calls gruppetti, and he calls them on the beat, together with the melodic notes, which is also whole step, full step. But of course, if they played constantly on the beat, they cancel paradoxically the melodies first note, the D in the case of E, and the F sharp in the case of A, of D on the top. So it would be... I would say nano before the beat, but not as an upbeat, really almost merging in the beat, but voicing by the articulation of the thumb's knuckle itself the projection of the notes of the melody. So the crisp articulation, pianissimo, featherly, of these passing tones, beat whole passing tones, but a little 
more highlighted the theme. If not the theme, which is a great word for such piece in terms of its um, ability, but it's more like a motif, light motif. And the melody to isolate the right hand from playing grace notes, groups, and the melody, and have to have voiced, layered, hierarchized organization, which is difficult to manage for most. So we'll start playing this piece or want to play it better. We always are beginners in front of it, regardless when and how long it's been companion of our musical life, as in my case it is since childhood. But it doesn't make it easier. Let less. It only makes it more dig deep to find the exact balance, articulation, placement slightly before on the beat. Just to bring it out without any... Yeah, it's difficult because you have to do it without to show it up. So it has to be light. Um, in the spirit, um, rebouncing, almost like hopping from one spot to the another. A sense of lightness, a sense of irony, a sense of humor. I believe these um, uh, staccati octaves in a low register, very light, pizzicati rather than staccati. We're not taking into account by Debussy that the low register of the action of the pianos is heavier than if you have to do it here. In the pianissimo dynamic. So you have piano for the melody, pianissimo for the pizzicati, and a shadowy grace note for the baby glissando. To develop a good independence of the fingers, uh, it's a neurological fact almost, not even pianistic, is to organize in one's brain all these uh, independences of articulation, it's a cognitive feast. This was a demonstrative forte. In a way, the uh, redundancy coming from the forearms energy would sort of uh, play it in a very effective, easy way for the pianist whenever to be the same but whispered with intensity and somewhat like projecting the consonants in the um, whisper. Okay, that's mezzo for me. I have to make it piano. I don't want to use the unicorda because it only muffles it. It muffles it, that's what I meant. And I have to play the staccato notes of the theme on the edge of the keys. Because on the edge of the white keys or the black keys, the action allows through the leverage system to play at the moment of impulse. If you play it further in, it's heavier to play the note and therefore slower and for sure louder, which is exactly the opposite of what is written. It says piano, staccato and uh, the arpeggios on the beat. And he indicates nervous with humor. Nervous, nerveux in French means so unsettled. Um, always um, rebouncing from one spot to the other, bouncing rather, and with humor, as if the humor is not obvious in the piece, but it's good to have mentioned it in the words. So I will do this nano um, rubato, but almost not, but it is a little bit more like a squeezing of the repeated notes. As if it gets narrower, stretto into the middle of the repeated notes of the F sharp, and then loose with a CD. 
I must say that the CD indication in French is not slow down, it's more like in the car decelerate, take off the foot from the gas pedal and the car has the engine that slows it down in a more smooth way and lesser um, drastic. It's not a retenuto, which will be actively slowing down, it's more like a in tempo, but slightly let it um, away from the traction motion, just so it will slightly withhold the speed rather than slow down the speed. Because they have a retenu when it's slow or retenuto to slow down and CD which is more like um, take off of the tempo. Doesn't say how much but I think it's almost none. And the fact that he writes four sixteenth notes, two eighth notes is rhythmically in the bar of CD with um, slow down. Already a rhythmic articulation that brings us to the ritenuto by the values. If I stay strictly playing tempo, that's of course already ritenuto. If you get written, then we have ritenuto. Hesitant, sort of like as if, <laughs> but not. It's assertive, but precise and so stern. That was too much. I think lifting the wrist immediately after poking the octave from the edge of the key while squeezing the tips of the fifth and thumb against the keys around, like AF in this case, or EC in this. So the sixth inside the octave gives you the sense of um, control in the lower register with the resonant sounds because it's a very rich harmonic. Staccato in pianissimo. When you cut the sound, <coughs> as if you, like on the harp, when you put the hands to stop the, the vibration, the resonance, you don't let it go. Natural resonance, regardless of the acoustic, the pianos itself. Now, piano, please. Pianissimo. Then voice. Perhaps towards the thumb. Highlight it. Highlight it with First bar piano, second bar crescendo, third piano, subito piano, sort of that. Um, fourth bar pianissimo. And diminuendo. So if you start very soft and your piano is a sort of a pianissimo that you could obtain before it doesn't speak at all for the notes to be Swiss cheese or false. So I think you should start mezzo piano. Crescendo, subito piano, crescendo and then diminuendo pianissimo. So you can drop the fourth bar really down from having not started too softly down. So if you start like this. You navigate in a very small space between piano and pianissimo. <laughs> so if you give yourself a little shoulder space, oh, it's not comfortable, but at least I can move. Can drop, move within the context of the dynamic range. I mean. And of course, if I exaggerate the articulations robot, I sound drunk, and therefore I alter even the effect of the humor by overstating it. That would be too much. On the other hand, if it's straight, strict in tempo, so square, so recited, not narrated, not like speech, like a, yeah, a prose, not a poetry, just spoken speech. Nothing but to organize these four first uh, bars in dynamics, in articulation, in voicing, in precision, in extraction of the sounds, in lightness of the pedal, or the hint of pedal, 
and all that with a certain sense of just entering in the piece without a striking moment, since it's not that striking, it's more like an introduction. Because when we have... We are in the heart of the piece, or even in the beginning of the piece. after the ritenuto or CD, therefore not the ritenuto, just slow down, uh, the movement, but it is un peu plus allant. So it's a tempo, but a little faster. So it's not a tempo, it's faster than tempo, if tempo is not a bit. Then here it has to be the same, but therefore because it's faster. So how much faster than tempo? faster in order to obtain more effects of the articulation differences like the spiky chords forte or the staccato chords pianissimo compared to with the uh, wedges on them compared to the staccati was not connected like that but I just played them as patches staccato piano detached Playful in the sense of dance. Forte. Something almost like a toy soldier is playing trumpet. All that being in miniatures, in caricatures, in um, in description of something which you don't see but imagine. The power of imagination that in single chord in a given articulation triggers to the performer is just unbelievable. It's easy to say, difficult to do naturally, because we have to be respectful of the text but if we really want to do it, maximize that articulation or these contrast articulations, then we end up by really corresponding to the piece, perhaps even more than the composer imagined, and it's more even talking to the psyche of the listener, informed if they know the piece or uninformed if they just receive it as a narration, which is probably, I think, the candid best thing to do. But you don't choose for whom you play, if they know it or not, regardless. If they know it, they should rediscover it, and if they don't know it, they should just discover it, obviously. He sure didn't speak. Okay, to make an example of the different layers of articulations and dynamics, I will play first the page in the first page, um, but first I will play it without dynamic changes, only articulation dynamic um, contrasts. <laughs>
I digress to the second page already and even added an unbelievably wrong C flat for the third in the left hand, which is minor, major, major, minor. Sorry for this. Um, but the fact is, is that once you color it, dress it, articulate it, and um, toss it, so to say, rhythmically, to just exist by itself, and you just watch it dance in front of you in terms of music, rebouncing on the repeated notes, and uh, sliding on the grace notes, plucked like in an instrument like guitar or in mandolin, and then have these uh, um, humorous seconds. <laughs> which are in fact played together appoggiaturas. Which why I insist on voicing them to the top part of each. The appoggiaturas to the real notes. I think they are the real. So we have a... Louder and re la re la re la re softer. It gives a bit of three dimensionality to this um, very rhythmic, almost percussive um, element, which I think is very much participating to the humor. We have done some consonant thirds, would have been a bit more predictable in any case. Or, um, I don't know. But no. As if they're playing the wrong notes, but not. Like playing in the cracks. Almost like a child playing. In the sense of playing and experiencing and having fun. Like, <laughs> this kind of um, playfulness of the uh, grace note that is almost together with the real note. I think it functions if you voice the top and uh, therefore give to the seconds a little bit of a uh, two voice element, not just patches. But that could differ from one performer to another. trumpet call pa, 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 on F sharp and a few bars later in the second page same chorus break the modulation to flat keys like um, D flat rather E flat and interrupted like as if it's a fragment that is edited in the midst of the play forms. Minstrels are dancing and playing on their guitar. And in the middle of it, they're interrupted by a little um, brass section. <laughs> like some um, sarcastic laughs of the chorus. And you go back to the minstrel dancing. And this time is interrupted by another trumpet. was uh, ended with three chords and here by a little bit of French con con it's a French uh, what would we say uh, slang um, dance uh, sleazy dance yeah a little bit of a pop music of the low quality which he quotes in a collage in the middle of the Prelude. And goes back to the prelude. Then he says moqueur, persif persiflating. That is really the Prokofievian to come um, art of the irony and even more sarcastic sarcasms uh, I could hear it with some kind of um, uh, gossipy um, 
mother-in-law's um, uh, muted brass instrument in orchestration or imagination of orchestration, not the real and introducing these repeated notes of the theme or the light motif inside the harmonic harmonic notes Interrupting. Oops. Sorry for this. Yeah, it's constantly interruption. It's constantly um, trying to remain focused on your minstrels. In the wrong key F sharp when we're doing G major. And here he quotes them in F sharp. And interrupted by the laugh. In the first page, as if the interruptions brought me back to remember it's in G major. What was I doing? That's purposely being lost. And again, A flat instead of F sharp. So here I was too low by half step, and here I'm too high by half a step. So it's not in F sharp, not in A flat, it's in G. Not in A flat, in G. And no, I'm in G. Really? In A? No, in G. It's a very playful dialogue between um, cutting uh, chords that possibly never answer in the echo of the tonality but always off the tonality F sharp A flat major dominant or A major or E major so of course none of these are tonalities as such they're just hints of colors of a tonic of a given key but punctuated by the return of the ending of the leitmotif in G major, no matter what the others answer. F sharp, G major. A flat, G major. A major. Now, this time we don't even answer by the arpeggio ending of the leitmotif. You answer to this call of other tonalities in a playful, cunning way. Well, by dominant but drummed. Military drum, and it says quasi, well, almost like a um, drum, tambour. It's not the body rhythm. In fact, he just plays the displaying of the, he displays the accompaniment. pop song of the day, just a fragment of it, contrasting with its very uh, syrupy lyrism, and interrupted by the sarcasm, attempting a second time, so for the harmonization, Coda, we restart. This collage of fragments is um, so modern for 1910. Perhaps even for us today, too, differently, because we've heard more and uh, drastically more modern music. But modernity in those days was also the lack of continuity in the development of a given thematic element. Of course, that's what uh, Debussy does anyway. He takes a uh, um, cell and makes it an echo, or three times, and he just repeats over it and makes out of it something else that results into another cell. So cellularly, so to say, he evolves through the piece with patches of things interrupted by quotes of this kind of 
Poupoul, le Vim Poupoul dance um, that is purposely quoted in the middle of a serious classical music, even if it's more about collage in times, because obviously the minstrels in their own Renaissance century also were singing popular tunes. So I guess he just puts them in perspective. For those who know the tunes, they realize how much ironic it is to quote them in the middle. But what can we do? That's what he does. And out of context, the humor of the quotations is lesser obvious up to the uninformed ear. But even if you don't know that, you feel that there is a rupture, interruption. Uh, <laughs> dancing no wonder Debussy was uh, always inspired by his friend Satie who was um, in titles the titles of his works even more humorous sometimes than the pieces themselves according to Jean Francais who used to tell me that himself being a master of musical harmony, but also irony, in the sense of um, playful, light-mooded um, um, way of being. The elegance of desperation is to smile. The elegance is not to be heavy, redundant, and uh, overstating. Uh, but in this case, it's more like uh, playful, ironic, jokingly so, cunningly so, and finding in the quality of the staccato, the quality of the laugh that you want to sort of translate in music through this um, imitation of different humor um, reactions. <laughs> the different levels of operatic laugh compared to uh, Obviously, there are different types of staccato, different types of non-legato, different types of rebounds or half rebounds. It's, it's the variety of the articulations that is its richness, inevitably. Crescendo subito piano. But the piano and pianissimo are not different. Did it speak? Did it speak? I think I heard it. Whisper. Whistle. automatic applause in sit comedies that interrupt or punctuate. You have to be mentally so alert when you play it, not only for the quality of the articulations that you have to, to master, but also because you have to be ahead of each section. Each section comes quite quickly in the continuum of the piece and therefore if you're not attentive to be uh, anticipating mentally the next articulation, you'll always be one articulation late, so you adjust as it goes and it's always off the section, you just finish it, oh I just know what I'm doing, too late. You have to be ready to be incisive, cross hands or not, and voiced. So when you arrive from Tenissimo slard with staccati, and slide with the new tone. Here you prepare the incisive chords, staccato, legato, tenuto, staccato, pianissimo, forte, with wages, forte crescendo subito piano, by the time I say it, it's already a bar passed, so I cannot speak, say and announce, I shouldn't, I have to do it in my playing.
season. And not the usual dominant tonic bass, because he'll do at the end just after that. A plagal cadence, so it's no point to play 5-1 for, 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 for 1. I assume that's why. But um, the fact of anticipating for each section or subsection or even each detail in order to create a continuum by the pulse but the differentiation of character for each hint of a fragment of an embryo of an idea. Oh God, so amazingly difficult because so amazingly short and so diverse and so hinting, so um, gesturing by um, hint and that you have to sort of make sure that you find the right tone. If you overstate it, it becomes overly caricaturesque, even if it has potentially that by its devastating humor embedded in it. But on the other hand, if you do it more mildly or more tamed or in a more um, polite way, a little bit less middle of the range of emotional expression, you might lose some of these um, um, contrasting chiseled articulations. I think it's to a certain extent a piece that depends very much of its surroundings. If you play the preludes in the order they come, it's the last one of book one. But if you play it alone or in a choice of other preludes, you play differently if you come from a slow dreamy one or if you've played another fast one. I think it's like everything in music. It's not like um, uh, something you reproduce every time precisely. It's always this kind of beauty of the ephemeral moment, the sand castle on the beach that is erased by the sea and restarts again when you rebuild it. But differently, almost, but the shapes and the contours. So it's more like uh, trying to catch an elusive moment and uh, grab the audience for a minute and say, just stay a minute with me, I'll tell you this very funny joke. <laughs> admire people who are able to tell jokes, even if the joke is more or less tasteless, if it is, or sometimes whatever. But the way some people say, even the most banal thing, it makes you captivated by their aura charisma of the way they say. They could read the phone book for that I know, and you think that, oh, that's incredible, isn't it? And others um, need a lot of information and inspiration and indication and uh, food um, uh, like uh, for thought or possibly also spoon food, spoon fed food for thought to think what should I think in each section I'm going to play and then align them like um, Lego pieces and hope that at the end the sculpture holds it itself. I don't know what very well. It doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't be by itself very making sense. It's more about um, reactive to the mood of the moment. You react to the staccato, you react to the repeated notes, you react to the loud laughs, loud laughs chords, to the thirds, to the dance. Uh, Everything, in fact, is made to react to. You react to what you play, or the audience reacts to what you played, and you react to what you read, which you play, play and then they hear. It's a lot of reaction, uh, instantaneously, and some of them are lost in translation between the performer's delayed ability to articulate differently the articulation of this gift section or this other section. And if it's too much pedal, then it gets covered, too. I mean, there's so many reasons for which it can be clouded. But when it's crisp, clear, articulated, anticipated, funny, dosaged, exactly, precisely organized, like a um, very subtle psychological hint and not something very, yeah, was well, like people telling a good joke or telling very well a bad joke. That's part of the interpretation, not that we have to save the piece because it's bad, rather we have to just uh, live up to the expectation of the piece, but once you're aware of all these elements that are constitutive of it, the staccato, the articolato, the ritenuto, the expressive, the quotes, it becomes a, I would say, brain salad, because it's a little bit of different vegetables and everything is there, so you have to, I taste this and I experience that and I drink this and I smell this.
frankly, I think it should be played a very entertaining, not exaggerated caricature, but who's deciding at which point you pass into the bad taste and which time you still remain on the side of the border of the good taste, spirited, elegant, rebouncing, perhaps almost too elegant to be saying some kind of this type of perhaps blasphemous humor. Who knows what they say? Which is good that there's no words for it. But you just assume, I didn't hear what was so funny, but I hear the laughter ah, of the people. Let me see from close up, what's happening? What's a minstrel dancing? Of it, you just react to it as it's thrown to you by patches. Something is gonna happen. And anticlimatically, you quote some sleazy song. It has nothing to do with the piece of the minstrels. You try to remember them in the left hand. Or in the middle of the right hand. And again, interruption. where you finally a little bit settle because you discovered so many little hints of so many fragments that are thrown to you in different articulations as a listener and now that you hear it from the beginning and the end you're almost reassured oh yeah that's the beginning and the drum but this time no, I just don't know. sforzissimo crescendo sff which means um, dry and slightly with hell because of the, I guess, um, plagal cadenza. I didn't say how much. I could think it's too much. In tempo, it's not enough. And delay too much is affected. So, what is the real, the real voice of it? some kind of natural withheld but not stopped. Nothing is natural. Everything is artifice. But artifice becomes nature. That's why art, acting, playing, delaying. And of course, ultimately, the instrument you play sometimes doesn't repeat the notes. Your fingers are a little bit gluey. And then all of a sudden, the effect of the drum is gone. But of course, you can immediately jump to the next effect of the little song, and then you go back to it at the end. Hopefully, this time the repeated notes in the lower register will repeat easier, even if he says pianissimo for the lower register. To play quickly, triplet, ddd, re 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 in a lower register would have been so much practical in the high register for the art lightness of the touch. And then, I don't hear clearly. To hear clearly, I'll have to play louder. Then I lose the mystery of it, uh, or the humor of it. Possibly without changing fingers. With a stiff wrist for once, but very briefly. Or three to one, three to one, or three to three, three to three. And 
Kenzimo. I think it's more interesting this way. It's a distant echo of the forte upper register in the um, third page, in the last fourth page. But if you play soft, you don't hear it. You have to repeat it. Perhaps with the thumb of the left hand inside the key. Microgrammage of uh, balancing so that it can speak whispered. Uh, compared to more sarcastic in the other than the more I will play, practice, think, try, restart, organize, connect, rebuild, restart, reorganize, rebuild, until I find what is, through the passage of the sections, the most natural, if not path, at least there must be an organized um, tour of the minstrel's prelude during the performance mentally. So you're always like a conductor ahead who doesn't play, but you have to play reactively to what you have heard and seen and counted. And you always finish the piece thinking, oh God, so in so many sections I didn't do like I wanted because they almost passed too fast in front of me. It's like watching the landscape from a bullet train window. You blink and all of a sudden it's a sea or it's a mountain. <laughs> well, I exaggerate, it's not warp speed at that point, but still, in relative terms it is. Um, when you have such a concise, artic um, articulated piece, every milligram, every, every millisecond, something happens that reacts on the rest and rejoices or, re or, 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 or shines or shadows over the other section. And so it's not just a section by section, Prelude. It's a prelude made of these different sections, interruptions, connections, hints, which have to be all brought into their um, most natural spoken um, level. Honest. Not honest as dishonest, but honest as um, displaying it for what it is. And sometimes one feels compelled on stage to seduce the audience, especially if the piece is so playfully cunning, that we add on top of the humor that Debussy embedded in the scores, uh, notes of the score, our own attitude, which is sometimes very <laughs> enticing to do. I mean, if you don't and you remain like a marble statue playing this love, love ball, I don't have it. Or you could do this type of Buster Keaton humor that the man never smiles but he does belong to comic situations in the silent movies. Or you are going to participate to the laughter with the audience and the performer. And you're going to accompany the playfulness with your own playfulness on top of it. I think a little of that is very necessary. But it should not... Um, overwhelm you when you perform on stage because sometimes that is what you do the adrenaline the excitement to be there and to share with everybody this music that is so incredibly enticing so you have to not tame it but focus it organize it give it its real um, parfum its real um, um, juice and um, not diluted in our own psyche oh it means to me so much I'm gonna make it even more crescendo more pianissimo my piano, my acoustic, my feeling. Yes, of course it's your piano and your acoustic. It is not his and it's no more then. And it's not in the context of the Belle Epoque of 1910 in France. And regardless, it's just by the few sounds and interrupted silences, I think you uh, reproduce an atmosphere or something that oh, you could have known if you had been there. So it's a little bit of archaeology, but more by hint than by excavation. Uh, sort of a spiritual um, archaeology. 
to replace it in its context by understanding it, but mostly by finding the humor of it intemporal. After all, <laughs> it's a laugh. Uh, perhaps not of the same things as then, but nevertheless, the richness of it is that it doesn't have any text. Therefore, it's our own text in the imagination of the storyline, in the narration. The rest is to be eventually uh, imagined differently by the audience members than yourself, and that's fine. Actually, it's even better. It's richer. At so many levels, it's inspiring to play Debussy, to share Debussy, to share the mood of the music of Debussy, to simply entertain, in the best sense of the word, your audience. Thank you.